14 million years ago, the eastern tropical Pacific exploded in a series of volcanic eruptions spewing out molten lava from the depths of the tropical Pacific. From a depth of 10,000 feet, new islands were born. Islands that had never been connected to a continental landmass, truly oceanic. Any life form that was going to get there had to fly, float, swim, or be carried by another organism. Today, we call this archipelago the Galapagos. It's iconic. I'm sure every single person in this room has heard of Galapagos. Times have changed in the past 14 million years. I might mention that those original islands even disappeared into the sea, and now they're part of a submarine ridge extending to the coast of South America, and the whole tectonic plate is being subducted beneath the coast of South America. That's been forming the Andes Mountains. The islands that are in the Galapagos today, the oldest rocks are about 3.4 million years ago. The archipelago is comprised of 14 major islands and 52 named isles and islets. They are a property of Ecuador. They're classified as a World Heritage Site. And today, the conservation community looks toward the Galapagos for their methodology in protecting the islands. It's not perfect, and I am privileged to travel there frequently, and sometimes we have American guests who are critical of the way the islands are being conserved, and I point out to them that we haven't done such a great job with Hawaii. And Galapagos has such potential. Uh, it has been known best, perhaps, for Charles Darwin's visit in 1835. My focus has been on life beneath the sea. The islands are home to more than 450 kinds of fish, including this magnificent hammerhead shark and 12 kinds of damselfish that I'm going to reflect upon in this talk tonight and use them to try to explain uh, how there is a paradigm shift, a shift in the way we look at the natural sciences way before Darwin, going back to Copernicus and Galileo. And when Darwin came onto the scene, the life sciences were mainly collecting and cataloging. And as the decades, the eons decades passed, humankind has been mainly concerned about how we can use these species that we discover. What benefit are they to us? And today we have to look at the life sciences a little bit differently. It's not just cataloging. It's figuring out how to make our existence sustainable and how we, are, we must accept the responsibility that we have for helping to preserve the biodiversity. In talking about paradigm shifts in the Galapagos, on my first expedition in 1975 as a deckhand, on a sailing vessel, I was serving as a navigator, a deck swabber, and a cook, albeit not the greatest cook in the world, but I managed to get to the islands, and uh, things changed in the last 40 years since I first went to the islands. And I bet many of you have never held a sextant, but all of you know about the GPS. Just think about how things changed. As I looked at this photograph and was deciding what I was going to say this evening to you, I realized that there was not only a paradigm shift in our methodology of natural sciences, there's a shift in my hairline as well. <laughs> um, I have been privileged to spend much of the past 40 years studying the marine life of the Galapagos. I went to great lengths to catalog and document uh, the fish of the islands. I'm indebted to the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History, which provided a base of research. I was an, an associate there in the section of ichthyology for several decades. 
Stanford University published my book in 1997. It took 20 years to write it. It is today the only comprehensive treatment of the fish of the Galapagos. I am, am so privileged to be able to go back each year taking travelers there and interpreting the, the natural history and the life sciences of the islands. But of all the fish that I studied, including 15 that were first collected by Charles Darwin in 1835, of all those fish, many of them beautiful, spectacular creatures, including that magnificent hammerhead and whale sharks and um, 11 other species of damselfish, this one, this ugly little, well, okay, it's not ugly, but it's not too exciting. It's pale gray, it's got a little black spot at the base of the pectoral fin. Azurina eupalama is its scientific name. It was first described in 1903. And so of all the 444 kinds of fish that I described and that I treated in my book, why am I talking about this one? Because it disappeared. I co-authored a paper a few years ago for the United Nations and we listed it as extinct. When it disappeared in 1982-83, it was the peak of a dramatic ENSO event, El Nino Southern Oscillation. The water got very warm in the East Pacific. Heavy rains, waterfalls formed in the Galapagos where there was never any flowing water. Many species of life were impacted. This fish declined greatly in number and soon I couldn't find any of them anymore. I wasn't seeing any Azurina eupalama the black spot chromus. And I began to wonder, why did it disappear? So I started looking at what does this fish eat? It's a plankton feeder. It survived and evolved over thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Because as I said earlier, uh, it, the Galapagos are home to many endemic species and this was one. So what caused the extinction? People don't eat this fish. There's no noticeable pollution on a large scale in the Galapagos, so it wasn't pollution. It became obvious that something changed in the ocean dynamics, the rate of upwelling, the productivity in the surface of the sea. And some of my colleagues agree that it is probably connected to the changes in the dynamics of the Pacific Ocean, which is connected to the dynamics of the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, and indeed the Arctic and the changing patterns in the Arctic Ocean associated to climate change may well be responsible for the extinction of this fish. Okay, so I've made my point that it's gone. When I first noticed this, the scientific community said to me, a fellow ichthyologist were saying, Jack, don't call it extinct. It's gotta be out there. There must be some of them. It hasn't shown up. We have now classified it as extinct. So I say to my colleagues, yeah, see, I told you so. But my travelers who were going with me to the Galapagos would say, who cares? So what? It's just one species. It's just one little fish. They're not even pretty. Why should we even worry about it? And I said, rather, you know, rather than answer that question directly, let me give you a metaphor. Imagine you're embarking on an aircraft and as you're going up the gangway, you see a technician with a needle nose pliers pulling out a single rivet. That technician might say to you, hey, don't worry, this plane will fly. Don't you see, has more than a million rivets, this plane will fly with no problem. When Darwin was in the Galapagos, it was not well understood that species, diversity, means stability. The more you have, the more stable the ecosystem. And today, we have removed so many species from the biosphere, we have to look closely at how long it will sustain life as we have known it to. So the black spot damsel became very important. I have actually communicated with more a marine scientist as a result of that damselfish than the other 443 different kinds of fish that were in the islands. When I sailed through the archipelago for about uh, a month and a half in 1995, 
as a deckhand and cook. I was also an undergraduate at the University of West Florida, and I began my studies. Uh, this was my first sight of Fernandina Island, the volcano that you saw erupting in the very first slide. When Darwin went to the islands in 1835, he was aboard a sailing vessel just uh, twice as large as the, Isop, uh, as the Alcinol II, which was the boat I was on. And during his five weeks in the islands, he collected fish, 15 different kinds, all of them new to science in 1835. Remember, at that time in the history of biology, naturalists we're collecting and gathering with the idea that we've got to, we've got to learn what's out there. This fish uh, was collected by Charles Darwin. It's now named after Charles Darwin. And I dare say my visit to the British Museum of Natural History to examine the 15 different kinds of fish that Darwin collected, one of the highlights was actually to be able to go behind the scenes into the section of ichthyology and examine fish like Semicostifus darwinii, a beautiful wrasse. Now you look at that and say, well, that's not beautiful. Well, bear in mind that the, that the crew members, or maybe Darwin himself, it's not documented, caught that fish, brought it onto the deck of the HMS Beagle, opened it up, salted it, and put it back together with some cotton, and now it's in the British Museum. Today, their numbers are greatly reduced. The RAS that, that I referred to that's named after Darwin is in the lower right-hand corner. If we do not maintain more marine protected areas, shown in all these tiny little dots, which represent less than 2% of the world's ocean surface, if you take all of those tiny little dots, put them together, they equal the quadrant in yellow. The red is the only areas, the no-take zones, are the only areas that we cannot collect and remove things from the ocean. I suspect, I'm sure, that Charles Darwin looked at the moon. I wonder, however, if he could conceive at the time when we could look at planet Earth from the other side of the moon. Today, we have to look at the diversity of life in a very different way than Galileo and Darwin because today we recognize that we are having such an impact on our biosphere that we are running the risk of changing the course of life on our living planet. Edward O. Wilson is one of my favorite life scientists, and uh, I want to send you home with, with a, a hopeful feeling, because it's not too late, but we are at a tipping point. When we discover that species go extinct like the little damselfish and we don't understand exactly why, I believe that that damselfish is a canary in the world's ocean. It's a canary in the coal mine. And as Edward O. Wilson, one of the great scientists of our day, concluded his book, The Future of Life, a civilization able to envision God and to embark on the colonization of space will surely find a way to save the integrity of this planet and the magnificent life it harbors. I would urge you to value the biodiversity of the planet and do everything you can to support sanctuaries, both on land and those in the sea, which refer, we refer to as MPAs, our marine protected areas. Thank you very much.